Another Great Depression is all but inevitable. That's the view of my guest today. No wonder he's been called the merchant of gloom. But then Steve Keen is one of the few economists to have predicted the global financial crisis. And while he used to be a lone voice challenging the economic consensus, more and more people are now listening to him. His way of avoiding depression? Write off the debt, bankrupt the banks, nationalize the financial system, and start all over again. Steve Keen, welcome to Hard Talk. Delighted to be here. Do you really think that we are headed for another Great Depression? We're already in one, and the same thing applied back at the last Great Depression, that people didn't call it one until after it was over. Because in an experience like this, you're always hoping that there aren't, there's change just around the corner, the system will turn around. It's only after you've been through it, people look back and see that it's been going for some years. So the Great Depression wasn't called the Great Depression until sometime in the late 1930s. So for those people who are watching, listening to this, thinking, OK, I can cope with things as they are now, mm -hmm. they should relax because it's just a few more years of the same? I wouldn't call it relaxing. Uh, but certainly, with the situation now, which, which economists in particular are hoping is transient, is going to be a, a drawn-out experience. The, the best we can hope for is something like what Japan has been through, where Japan still talks about having had a lost decade since 1990, but it's really been a lost two decades. The best we can hope for is a lost two decades. If we leave it to the basic mechanism by which capitalism eliminates excessive debt, which is bankruptcy and a slow grinding process of paying the debt down. Once we get back down to the level of debt that the system actually needs, which is far lower than the level of private debt we have now, then the process will be over. But that could take something like 20 years. And you've also suggested that it could t take a rising level of violence. Well, the, the trouble is when you have a, a, a growing population and an economy which is used to growth, and people expecting to get employed when they leave school and they find that in fact there's not enough new jobs coming on to handle the new entrance into the labour market. Even if you grow slightly less than uh, the rate of population change, that means a, a population, which is the, you're saying in the recent media, uh, is uh, a lost generation. Well, that lost generation only has one outlet, and that's frustration and violence. It is, it is not the way to manage as effective society to be caught in a trap like this. And of course what we know from the last Great Depression mm. was that it had a profound effect on politics and not least led to the rise of, for example, Hitler. Absolutely. Hitler got there because he was the person who uh, reversed the conventional economic behaviour of his time and turned Germany around from unemployment of you know, 25 per cent and more down to full employment, of course building a huge war machine in the process, regarded as a god by his people for doing it. And then we had the catastrophe of the Second World War. But he would never have rose to, risen to prominence had it not been the total despair of people in the middle of the last Great Depression. So you can have very, very bad social outcomes out of a process like this, even if people get enlightened about what caused it and after the event have more wisdom about the amount of debt they'll take on, the transition to be dreadful. Okay, what we have seen so far have been movements like the Occupy Wall Street mm. or in, in capital cities around the world, and, and I know you've spoken to those protesters mm. in Sydney. Um, that, though, when you think about their anger, it's, not, it's neither left nor right, but it's no. certainly not right wing. No, that's right. It, the, that's one of the positives to me because, I mean, the Tea Party uh, was a predecessor in, in that sense in terms of a, a visceral reaction to what they thought was going wrong with the economy, and that has certainly had a right wing flavour to it. This Occupy Wall Street really is uh, progressive, and you, generally you, you typecast them as left, and I've certainly seen quite a few politicians saying it's the, the usual suspects in the, in the protest movement doing it. But in fact, it's been very broadly based, very much youth based but also, particularly in America, large numbers of people who are laid off industrial workers, some laid off financial workers, uh, people who wouldn't normally expect to be sitting in a tent uh, at the bottom of Wall Street. So why do you think that's heartening? Because in a, what, what's a major part about their attitude is that they feel that they've had their trust in society betrayed and that they, are, but they want to bring about a harmonious society. They're not socialist in the old-fashioned way 
uh, you know, overthrow capitalism style of a lot of previous protests. They are emphasising that they believe society should be something we can actually trust in and that that's been destroyed by what's happened with the financial sector. They're trying to rebuild that trust. They're not quite certain how. It is a very vague movement. But that is not your... You know, man the ramparts, burn everything down. Some socialism. of them are, of course, opposed to capitalism. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, which you are not. It's no. just the, for, the form that this capitalism is taking. I'm opposed to capitalism parasiting itself, which happens when we let the financial sector take over and generate far more debt than we need. OK, and before we get into, into that, as far as these uh, protesters are concerned, you've told them that actually they should be going further. In a sense, you've sort of seen it as a call to arms. You said you should be occupying the economics departments of universities. Yeah. Because basically you don't get into as disastrous a situation we're in now without extraordinarily bad thinking. And the economics departments were the, were the source okay. of that bad thinking. How far do you think they, they should go then? I mean, would you be saying to everybody, get out on the streets? Would you be telling people? I mean, do, we is, certainly, that the, is that the way that you feel about it? I think, yes. I think we have to, we have to change the political uh, uh, power balance right now because fundamentally the financial sectors, effectively the creditors of the world, were dominant politically. They've certainly set the political agenda for the last 20 or 30 years. The debtors have been down the bottom of the pile. Now we need to reverse that and turn the power back towards the debtors rather than the creditors. And your argument is that politicians won't listen until there's something to make them listen. Absolutely. I mean, politicians are reactive individuals. They're not leaders, most of them, vast majority of them. They're been going along with the general trend of believing that a you know, larger financial sector, uh, more deregulation is a good thing. And their, their campaign donations come from there as well as the overall milieu in which they think. To get them to change around from that, they really have to see that as being a dead end, not a way to re-election, but a way to losing elections. OK, but what your, your antidote, your solution, is remarkably radical in that, and I, we should write the debt off, mm. bankrupt the banks, nationalise the financial system and start all over again? That's if it was easy to do. It's not. If we had the situation of the 1930s where the banks owned all the debt, so the banks had extended the loans and therefore if you wrote the loans off, the banks were the only sector that would directly suffer, would be easy. The trouble, trouble is the banks haven't simply sold, created far more loans than they should have to the debtors. They've also then bundled those in securities and sold those to pension funds and individuals. It's, so it's too interconnected It's to far too interconnected to do it in the old-fashioned way of a jubilee. Uh, you could not do it without causing okay. as much disruption as you're trying to prevent. Now, you've used the phrase, the old-fashioned way of a jubilee, and mm. that's because it, it's something that uh, has happened historically. Yeah, yeah. Which is a writing off of debts. Yeah. Uh, there's actually one of the... Well, if, you have, if, you have, if you've been to the forum in Italy and, and taken a look at the, uh, the fresh, fresh years that are cut under the stone there, one of them is of the burning of the books of debt, which is a regular activity in pre-capitalist societies of actually writing off the debt completely and liberating people who've been put into debt slavery beforehand. If you hadn't had that escape valve, none of those societies would have lasted. OK, well, tell us how it could work as you're proposing it. Whose debts are you writing off? Well... You have to see whether debt is a good or bad thing. And debt, in some senses, is definitely a good thing because rising debt is what actually fundamentally finances investment. Increase in productivity, new technologies, the iPads of the world and so on, fundamentally they're financed by rising debt levels. That's a good aspect of debt. The negative side is when we borrow the money to gamble on rising asset prices. And that's what we've been doing globally, encouraged by the banks to gamble on rising okay. share prices, rising house prices. So I want to buy, borrow a million pounds because of this fabulous idea that is going to be a new technology, a new innovation, yep. and society will benefit from yep. it. Good. Yeah. I want to borrow a million pounds because I want to gamble it on other financial instruments. Bad. That's right. But what, if you look at the, the form of the good bit, in America's economy, for example, that seems to be something which is sustainable with the debt level of something like about 50% or 70% of one year's GDP, whereas the current level of debt in America peaked at 300% of GDP. It's about five times, four to five times the level of government debt. But that's not all bad debt. Some of that is, an awful say, lot of that, for example, uh, in the United States, as we know, hmm. is people wanting to own a house and, to, and in order to do so, taking out a mortgage. Yes, but the thing is, what they've been caught up in, and that has caused a bubble in house prices. There's no denying now that there's been a house price bubble, and the cause of it was actually borrowing money in the first place. Without the house price bubble, they could be back with a 75% level of debt. OK, but so where we are now... Hmm. Are you saying that you write off the mortgages, the debts of people like you and me? Yes. Even people who can afford to pay? We have to look at 
the situation we're in and say, what do we face if we continue trying to honour debts that we now know should never have been extended in the first place? What do we face? The best example of that is Japan, and Japan is a far more cohesive society than anywhere else on the planet, really. And they have been in a 20-year slump where, where the rate of growth has been lower than their population growth, and they're having rising unemployment, even with a falling population. Now, if we look at that in OECD nations, we face two decades of that. So what I'm talking about, yes, of course, this is an extreme change, but it's basically admitting something which should be obvious to everybody on now. Okay. The credit system has failed. Okay, but, but in terms of what the solution is, and we can get into mm. the details yeah. of, of, of why you think the economic model has all been wrong, but if you look at the solution, you're saying, mm. basically, write off the debts of anyone who owns a mortgage? No, no, I, I would... You, there is a certain level of debt which is necessary for such things as obviously business investment, but also there's a, a proportion of people who wish to own their own homes. And if we go back historically and see what level of debt that that involved in terms of the ratio to the GDP, well, then my own country of Australia, for example, that level of debt was about 10% of GDP. Now, it's since risen to 100% of GDP. Now, fully, most of that extra 90% simply finance the rise in house prices itself. It's a bubble. Okay. But somebody in, in, under your solution is coming in and saying that's good debt, that's a bad debt. No, I don't think we can't do it. If we try to do it on an individual basis, we'll be here forever and we'll feed lawyers okay. more than we Who's making the, the decision about the broad sweep? That's why it has to be an intelligent modern jubilee. We can't sort of say worthy borrower, unworthy borrower. Somebody who should... We have to have okay. a systemic approach because fundamentally households did not make the bad decisions. The bad okay. decisions were made by the banks to lend in the first but place. Accepting what you identify as the problem and trying to understand what the solution yeah. is, this systemic approach, mm. who, who, what is deciding in this new system that we're replacing the current bad one with, mm. who's deciding who gets the debt write-off and who doesn't? Well, I wouldn't say it's a kind of individual choice between one individual and another. It has to be a systemic process by which we reduce the level of debt finance money in the economy and increase the amount of government created money because we have two sources of money in a capitalist economy the banks can create money by extending loans the government creates money by running a deficit now we had back in the early sixties the ratio of government created money to the overall money supply was about fifteen percent it's fallen so far that we've got an entirely debt based system which is driven speculation. Sure. We need to create the government money to balance out the... So I'd, I'd okay. actually have a government creation of money system approach to try to rebalance the system and reduce the private debt. So the government, the central bank, mm. prints money to pay off people's debts? How, what I'm wondering is you yeah. say write-off debts and, mm. you want, and it's basically private debt that you want written off. Yeah. Mortgages, companies, debt. How, how is it working? How is that working? It would be a process, we'd have to give the money to the debtors rather than to the creditors. If you look at what's happened in the last three or four years, all the rescues Bernanke have done and the banks around the world have done has been to give money, create money and give it to the banking sector in the belief the banking sector will lend to get the economy starting again. Now, that is bizarre because we know one thing, reason they won't lend is they've lent too much already. So all that money has been ineffective. But who, so who are you giving the money to? I'm trying to get yeah, to, the, to the better give, solution. I'd be, I'd be, what, what, you have to, what you would have to do, and it's not easy, it's not a simple thing, it's not thing I can give a, a cartoon version of right now. It would be a very okay, sophisticated approach. Okay, but it's a working approach. model. It's a working model, but the idea would be you would give the money to the public and, say, and if you, the public got the money and the person who received it was in debt, the first thing I would have to do is pay their debt level down. They could not spend. So basically a government level. will say, look, we're not giving this extra money to the banks. We might even take back the money that we put yeah. into the banks. We're going to give it all, per, effectively per capita. If you have any debts, it has to go to that. That's right. It pays the debt down first of all. So the reason that I, we have to do something like this rather than simply writing the debt off is that if you don't do... And you, you give money to everybody. It's a tax cut. Pardon? It's a tax cut. Uh, no. It's very different to cutting a tax. If you give the money to everybody and then require those who are in debt to reduce their debt, then they're better off, obviously. But the complaint people make about a jubilee or a debt write-off is, what about me? I've saved money, I've bought bonds, exactly. I'm going to lose. It's the moral now, hazard argument. Yeah, it's basically, if, you're, you're rewarding failure. Yeah, but the thing is, the system has failed, not the individuals in it. And if we don't admit that, we're going to spend another 20 years in this grinding process. But, but you will you, have people running yeah. businesses who hear this and yeah. say, well, hold on a second. They've I been have, getting the money I as have well. Been, but they've been managing themselves well. Their rival, who, who 
was a badly run business mm. and should have gone out and the process of this yeah. of a recession would have weeded them out because they weren't well run, they're going to get a, a boost too. Everybody gets a boost because we're not trying to boost individuals. We're trying to eliminate a mistake of the financial sector that's been going on for 40 years. It's, the scale of what I'm talking about sounds extreme in contrast to normal policy. But normal policy has allowed a 40-year build-up of the level of debt to simply unsustainable scales. And one of my colleagues, Michael Hudson, puts it beautifully, debts that can't be repaid won't be repaid. You simply have to work out how you don't repay them. This is, we have to have a sophisticated approach to eliminating a systemic level of debt should, that should never have been built up in the first place. Okay, so you give all this money to individuals mm. or companies, and mm. that, which mm. is, there's that measure of how you give to companies. They pay back to the banks who they loan to. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said if we keep the parasitic banking sector alive, the economy dies. Under your model, these parasitic banks, as you call them, would die? No. If you did that, what would happen, if, if you did a normal debt write-off, yes, the banks would have to be bankrupted, reorganised, nationalised and sold again later back into private ownership. I'm not arguing for nationalisation of banks permanently. But if you did this, they wouldn't need to be because what they'd lose in loans, they'd gain in loan repayment. Their assets wouldn't change. But what would happen, of course, is they actually make money out of the loans. So their cash flow would decline radically. So you'd probably still have organisations which would be financially challenged by that. Their cash flows would, would drop drastically. So the banks would still have difficulty. We still need to manage them in some fashion, but it wouldn't be a case of having to shut them all down because fundamentally they're not just illiquid. Most of them on current conditions are insolvent. So, but if you are effectively ensuring their survival this way, well, mm. why... What do you mean when you say we need to kill off these parasites? Banking behaviour can be positive when it provides investment funds for corporations and working capital and a small amount of money for consumption. That's the positive role of banking. It's become a negative role because fundamentally they're financing Ponzi schemes. They're giving us money to gamble on asset prices, but the money they're giving us to gamble with is actually what's causing asset prices to rise. And this, this behaviour has taken over the financial sector in the last 30 or 40 years. And this is really... That's is, the parasitic behaviour. And this, and, and this parasitic behaviour, in a way, goes to the heart of your argument and your thesis about what has been wrong yeah. with the model of economics for decades. Mm. And you, you had... Um, I mean, we talk, you talk about the instability there, mm. uh, which your argument is that actually instability is a good thing, or at least it can be a good Instant, thing. This is the, the classic argument for the non-orthodox economists have been making ever since Joseph Schumpeter, and that is that instability in capitalism is part of why it's creative. The instability that means that you have a, a you can see a potential opening for a, a solid state recording device over those kludgy old Walkmans gets us to iPods and all the technological developments we've seen now that are actually part of Occupy Wall Street on, on a grand scale. That's a creative instability. Now that also has over the top of it the possibility of financial instability, which is the dangerous ones. So I'm trying to promote what I see as creative instabilities and reduce the destructive instabilities of capitalism. And your argument about the way capitalism has worked is that it allowed, it unchained Frankenstein's monsters, which is this financial instability, the way you, you refer to it. If you look at Robert Harris's book, he starts with a quote from Frankenstein in the Fear Index. So yes, there is a way in which banking, the, the danger in the system is that banks make money by creating debt. They always want to create debt, but most of us will decline the opportunity to take that debt on because debt's not a good thing. Having debt is an obligation. The, for example, mortgage, the meaning of mortgage is death contract in Latin. It's not a charming thing to be in. The only reason we take on more debt than we need is because we get persuaded that we can make a gain out of it by leverage speculation. And when that, that lets banks persuade us to take on far more debt than we should, which they've very successfully done in the last 40 years, largely under but, the cover of my, of my discipline. OK, but you talk about uh, banks persuade us to take on more yeah. debt. It sounds as though your model, which is that people's debts would, could be written off, yeah. would persuade them to do it all again. And, 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 That's you, why you've got to stop. You have to prevent the possibility of asset bubbles being financed by, by leverage again. OK, but so you're saying you wipe the slate clean. But take it, I mean, so, uh, yeah. the example is in Greece. There was, they looked at the figures, the, the EC task force that's going yeah. in to try to sort it out. And their quarterly thing said that there's 60 billion euros of outstanding unpaid taxes. Now, that's effectively private debt that's owed to the mm. government. And, if, you know, those people, if, if you know, if it's, if it's wiped off... Well, that's, I mean, the, the, we're getting confused between private debt and sovereign debt and also the very peculiar nature of the Greek 
taxation yeah, and financial Yeah, but the Greeks wouldn't have the sovereign debt problem if people paid their taxes. The well, point you, is well, there's people who wouldn't pay their taxes. You've and got, if got they... a sovereign debt problem everywhere else as well. I mean, America's got rising levels of sovereign debt. Why does it have rising levels of sovereign debt? Because the private sector is reducing its debt, having caused far too much to begin with. All this emanates across most of the globe back to a private debt bubble. Greece is a, rather an anomaly. If we actually focus ourselves upon the anomalies and analyse to do what to do in their cases, we're going to mislead ourselves with the rest of the system. Except, isn't it, because your argument has been, and you did have a bit of a eureka moment, a light bulb moment, which you, I think you identified to the first, the 1am in the morning on a December uh, morning, in, back in 2005, when yeah. you looked at the private debt figures for Australia, yeah. and growing exponentially, which you actually, I think you describe as you, you wrote, and then you actually checked and thought, hold on a second, it is. Yeah, I was going to, I'd written the word exponential, ex, growth, the debt has risen exponentially compared to incomes in an expert witness case as a draft, and I thought I can't really get away with that as the expert. I'm not the barrister, I can't use hyperbole. So I dived in to check the data and thought it won't be quite exponential, so I'll need to modify, but it's certainly been rising. That was in the back of my mind. I plotted the data and the perfect exponential curve from 1964 through to 2005, and I thought this process has to change. When it changes and debt starts to reduce again, we're going to have an enormous financial crisis. Somebody has to raise the alarm, and I'm probably that somebody. And you try, and you were called a tall poppy, poppy for doing so because you were going against the grain. Oh yeah, yeah. Because people weren't taking account of private debt. They didn't think that it was necessarily important. They worried about government debt, but yeah. not what individuals would take. Rational individuals would take. And taking that's on. because economists have a mythical view of how money is created that basically sees. Uh, banking as being an intermediary between people who are patient and therefore save money and people who are impatient and therefore want to spend money and all you're doing is transferring spending power from the patient to the impatient so you can forget about the aggregate level of debt. All that economists. Is a are, you the, are you the only, I mean you, you say and, and when you read your, a lot of your material it's yeah. very much you alone are clever enough to see this and the no, others are. No, no, no. I'm standing on the shoulder of a true giant which is Hyman Minsky and there's many other non-orthodox economists around the world who have also been influenced by Minsky and have not been listened to. I've just got the loudest mouth, but certainly I'm not the only one. But you, uh, you've re referred to the sort of things won't change until there are progress occurs one funeral at a time when you're talking about economists. I was actually using an analogy from Max Planck, talking about physicists and explaining why he failed to convince his Maxwellian colleagues of quantum mechanics and finally abandoned the possibility of ever doing it and thought he just had to wait until each of them die off and the young kids come through who can cope with something as as bizarre as quantum mechanics to understand the world properly. A similar thing applies in all sciences, but economics is actually probably worse on that front. And they are so wrong, and you are so right? They are so wrong, and they should know they're so wrong, but they don't know their own literature well enough to realise that they're wrong. But we you are, do? I do, and so does a large number of non-orthodox economists. I'd say probably about 10% of academic economists would fall into the non-neoclassical camp. They'd be calling themselves either post-Keynesians or Austrians. There'd be some Marxists, evolutionary economists, and so on. We've been watching this deluded majority and being excluded and cut out and, 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 and derided ourselves by that majority, knowing they're following a totally foolish vision of how capitalism functions. And ultimately, the only way you can convince the world that they're wrong is after they have caused a spectacular economic crisis, which they've done. So now we're coming out of the woodwork. We've been there for 40 and, or 50 years. And just a final thought. In your world view, in your view of how things are happening, can mm. you see a politician bold enough to do what you think is necessary? Not yet. I would have hoped if Obama had been elected in 2012 rather than 2008, it might have been possible because he could have seen, somebody with his charisma could have seen that. But unfortunately, I can't see anybody in the horizon right now. Steve Keane, thank you very much for coming on Hard Talk. You're welcome.